Price of Fear. Brought to you by Vincent Price. Glancing through my morning paper over breakfast today, I noticed that an enterprising gentleman in the catering business has invented a musical hot dog called, would you believe, a Humburger. <laughs> Isn't it amazing the things some people will eat? Food, by the way, is something of a hobby of mine, and I never cease to wonder at the incredible results that can be achieved by a good chef with a few basic ingredients. A little meat, a few vegetables, a glass of wine, a sprig of parsley, and voila. You know, there are few more interesting experiences than being allowed into the kitchen of a really first-class restaurant to watch a master chef at work. And, of course, this uh, privilege is rarely extended to anyone, which reminds me of an experience I had a few years back. And to give it the right flavor, let's call it speciality of the house. I was staying in New York at the time, and a friend of mine, Harry Laffler, knowing that I was interested in good food, invited me to dine with him one evening at his favorite restaurant. Harry was by way of being an international advertising man, and knowing the size of his expense account, I had imagined that I was in for an evening at one of New York's plushier night spots. Imagine my surprise, therefore, when I found myself being ushered towards a, a shabby brownstone building in an almost deserted downtown back street. Well, here we are. This is Spiro's. What do you think of it? Well, Harry, it's... I must say, it's not quite what I expected. It, it is rather dismal, isn't it? I'll have you know that Spiro's is the restaurant without pretensions. It is the one place in these ghastly neurotic times that has refused to compromise. When you enter Spiro's, you leave the insanity of this hour, of this day, of this year, and you find yourself for a brief span restored in spirit. You make it sound more like a, like a cathedral than a restaurant. I wonder, I wonder if I've done the right thing in bringing you here. Oh, come on now, Harry. I, I was only joking. You see, you are the one person I know with the knowledge of good food. Thank you. Knowing about Spiro's and not having an appreciative friend to share it with is like having a unique work of art locked in a room where no one else can see it. Anyway, let's not stand here talking. Let's go in. Good evening, sir. Mr. Laffler and a guest. Ah, yes, sir. Uh, please come this way, gentlemen. Well, the waiter led us through a mirrored foyer into a small dining room. It was no size at all, but the half dozen or so guttering gas jets which provided the only illumination threw such a deceptive light that the walls flickered and faded into uncertain distance. There were no more than eight or ten tables in the room, and all but one were occupied. The few waiters serving moved amongst them with quiet efficiency. It really was very pleasant. And as soon as we were seated at the vacant table, I said as much to Harry. There. I knew you'd like it. But wait till you taste the food. By the way, did you notice that there are no women present? Yes, I, I did. Isn't that rather odd? Spiro doesn't encourage them. Oh. And I can tell you his method of getting rid of them is very effective. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, do you wish to be served now? Uh, tell me, is the special being served tonight, waiter? Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. There is no special this evening. But it's been a month already. And I had hoped that my friend here... Well, I'm sorry, sir, but you do understand the difficulties. Sir. Oh, well, what the hell. Uh, but I was hoping, Vincent, to introduce you to the greatest treat that Spiro offers. Oh, never mind. I'm quite sure that whatever we decide upon will be delicious. Uh, shall I serve at once, sir? Uh, yes, please. Mm. Very good, sir. Well, uh, Harry, have you ordered in advance? <laughs> no. No, I should have explained. Spiro offers no choice whatsoever. But suppose we don't like what we're given. Oh, don't worry. No matter how exacting your taste, you will relish every mouthful. Uh, just think a moment about the advantages of such a system. For instance, instead of a hurly-burly of sweating cooks trying to prepare a hundred different dishes, here we have a chef who stands serenely alone, bringing all his culinary arts to bear on one task. Oh, then you, 
You've seen Spiro's kitchen. Tell me, what's it like? Unfortunately, I can't. I've never seen it. Oh. Believe me, I've tried. In fact, I admit that my desire to see the inside of this particular kitchen has become almost an obsession with me. Well, have you ever mentioned this to Spiro? At least a dozen times. But he just shrugs his massive shoulders and smiles. Still, I've never given up hope. At this point, the waiter reappeared, bearing two soup bowls and a small tureen, from which he slowly ladled a measure of clear, thin soup. I must confess that I tasted this soup with some curiosity. It was delicately flavored, bland to the verge of tastelessness. Automatically, I reached for the salt. Well, what do you think of the soup? Mm, excellent. If you'll pardon me for saying so, you don't. What? You do not find it excellent. <laughs> you find it flat and badly in need of salt. But how, did uh, you... how do I know? Yes. Because that was my reaction when I first dined here. But I'm confident that you will make the same discovery as I did. By the time you've finished your soup, your desire for salt will be non-existent. Well, Harry proved to be quite right. And before I had finished the soup, I was relishing every mouthful of it. It was really wonderful. Harry smiled at me across the table. Well, do you agree with me now? Mm. Wasn't I right? Yes, you certainly were. You will find that the absence of condiments is only one of several noteworthy characteristics which marks bureaus. I may as well prepare you for the rest. For example, no alcoholic beverages of any sort are served here. Oh, really, Harry? Also, there is a ban on the use of tobacco in any form. Oh, but good Lord, is this a restaurant or a temperance hotel? You don't understand. By alternating stimulant and narcotic, you seesaw the delicate balance of your taste so violently that it loses its most precious quality, the appreciation of fine food. Not another word was spoken until we had both finished our main course. Nor was there any need for words in the presence of such food. It was delicious. And it was only with a great effort that I prevented myself from wolfing the lot at one go and establishing myself as a grade-A glutton on my very first visit to this amazing restaurant. When we had both finished eating, Harry and I smiled at each other contentedly. We were both aware that we had enjoyed an exceptional culinary experience. Harry, if I had any doubts about Spiro's, I apologize unreservedly. In all your praise of the place, there is not a single word of exaggeration. Ah, uh, that is only part of the story. You heard me mention the special, which mm. unfortunately was not on tonight's menu. Well... What we've just eaten is as nothing when compared to the absolute delights of that special. Oh, good Lord, what, what is it? I mean, nightingale's tongues, fillet of unicorn? Neither. It is lamb. Lamb? <laughs> oh, come on, you've got to be joking. If I were to give you in my own unstinted words my opinion of this dish, you would think me insane. <laughs> that is how deeply the mere thought of it affects me. It is a select portion of the rarest sheep in existence. Lamb Armistan. Armistan. A remote and almost unknown place on the border which separates Russia and Afghanistan. From chance remarks dropped by Spiro, I gather that it's hardly more than a plateau which grazes the pitiful remnants of a flock of superb sheep. Spiro, by some means or other, has obtained exclusive rights to this flock and is therefore the only restaurateur in the world ever to have lamb armistan on his menu. I can tell you, the appearance of this dish is a very rare occurrence indeed, and nobody ever knows the exact date on which it will be served. Oh, but surely Spiro could provide some advanced knowledge of this event. Well, huh? The only objection to that is simply stated. Should advanced information slip out, then the professional gluttons in which this city abounds, would get the opportunity to taste this dish and sooner or later drive out the regular patrons. You don't mean to say that these few people present are the only ones in the entire city who know of the existence of Spiro's? In the entire world. Oh, that's incredible. It's kept a secret by every single patron. A solemn obligation. By accepting my invitation this evening, you automatically assume that obligation. 
I hope you can be trusted with it. Well, if that's the way you want it, Harry, of course I can. It may sound strange to you indeed. It may border on eccentricity. But I'm a solitary man. And I feel to my depths that this restaurant is both family and friend to me. I must confess that until that moment, I, I had never really thought much about Harry's private life. To me, he was a pleasant friend and dining companion, and his private affairs had never really concerned me. Now, hearing him refer to Spiros in this manner, I almost came to feel sorry for him. By the end of two weeks, Harry's invitations for me to join him at Spiros had become something of a, of a ritual. Now, I am by nature one of those people with a lean and hungry look, but I began to notice that I was rapidly putting on weight. I was, to tell the truth, becoming plump. I began to wonder whether Harry, by no means a lightweight, had also been lean before he started to dine at Spiro's. Thinking the whole thing over, I decided that I would not refuse to eat at the restaurant until I had both tasted the lamb Armistan and also been introduced to the amazing Mr. Spiro. And then one night, a few weeks later, I achieved both these ambitions and both, I may say, exceeded my expectations. Ah, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Tonight is the special, sir. What? Well, <sighs> this is it. <laughs> the culinary triumph of all times. And faced bad, you are embarrassed by the very emotion it distills. Yes, I must confess that my heart is certainly beating faster than usual. Tell me, Harry, the, the other diners, do they feel the same way? Well, of course they do. Look around you and judge for yourself. Yes, you're right. Anyway, there's comfort in numbers. It's nice to know that we all have the same basic animal feelings and can anticipate, or, or should I say... <laughs> slaver over our meat. <laughs> oh, look, uh, one of our number appears to be in for disappointment. Hmm? Uh, look, over there, at the end table, the empty seat. Oh, yes, the stout ball man. Hmm. He's not here tonight. I do believe it's the first dinner he's missed here in weeks. Rain or shine, crisis or calamity, I don't think he's missed an evening at Spiro's in ten years. Imagine his disappointment when he finds that he's missed the speciality of the house. <clears throat> Oh. Mr. Laffler and friend, I am so pleased, so very, very pleased. Ah, oh, Mrs. Mira. Uh, tonight, gentlemen, the Lamb Armistan will be an unqualified success. I myself have been stewing in the miserable kitchen all day, prodding the foolish chef to do everything just so. The just so is the important part, eh? Uh, but I see your friend does not know me. An introduction, perhaps. The words ran in a smooth, fluid eddy. They rippled, they purred, and I found myself hypnotized and could do no more than stare as Harry performed the introductions. Spiro's mouth, the mouth that uncoiled this sinuous monologue, was alarmingly wide, with thin, mobile lips that curled and twisted with every syllable. He had a wide nose and wide-set eyes. It was an amazing face, and... Somehow I had the feeling that I had seen it before. It was somehow familiar. I am so very pleased to meet you, Mr. Price. So very, very pleased. Oh, thank you. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Spiro? You uh, like my little establishment, eh? Oh, yes. You have a great treat in store for you today, I assure you. My friend is by way of being a great admirer of yours, Spiro. It's true. A very great compliment. You compliment me with your presence and I return the compliment with my food, eh? <laughs> but I assure you, the lamb armistan is far superior to anything of your past experience. All the trouble obtaining it, all the difficulty of preparation is truly merited. You know, I've wondered why, with all these difficulties you mentioned, why you even bothered to present lamb armistan. Surely your other dishes are excellent enough to uphold your reputation. Yeah, perhaps it is a matter of psychology. Someone discovers a wonder and must share it with the others, eh? Mm. Or perhaps it is just a matter of good business. Well, then, in the light of all this and considering all the conventions you impose on your customers, 
Why don't you turn it into a private club? <laughs> so perspicacious. Ah, I will tell you. Because there is more privacy in a public eating place than in the most exclusive club in existence. Here, no one inquires into your affairs. No one desires to know the intimacies of your life. We are not curious about our guests. We welcome you when you are here. We have no regrets when you go. That is the answer, eh? Yes, I... I'm, I'm sorry. I, I had no intention of prying. No, 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 you are not prying. On the contrary, I invite questions. Uh, don't let Spiro intimidate you. I've known him for years, and I assure you his bark is far worse than his bite. But before you know it, he'll be showing you all the privileges of the house, except inviting you into his precious kitchen, of course. <laughs> now, for that, you may have to wait a little while, I'm afraid. What did I tell you? Come on now, Spiro. The truth. Has anyone except staff ever stepped into that kitchen of yours? You see on the wall over there the portrait of one to whom I did that honor. Hmm? A dear friend and a patron of long standing. Where? Oh, yes, there. Oh. Who is it? Oh, it's, it's Andrew Herring, the, the writer. You know the one, Harry. He used to write those marvelously cynical articles for the New American. And then he took himself off some to Mexico, I think it was, and, and disappeared. Of course. And here I've been sitting, staring at that picture for years without recognizing it. It must have been a blow for you when your old friend disappeared, Spira. It was, I assure you, gentlemen. But I like to think of it this way. He was probably greater in his death than in his life, eh? Hmm? Oh, a most tragic man. He often told me that his only happy hours were spent here at this table. Pathetic, is it not? And to think the only favor I could ever show him was to let him witness the mysteries of my humble kitchen. You know, you seem very certain of his death. I, after all, as I remember, no evidence has ever turned up to support it. None at all. Remarkable, eh? Ah, but no more talk, please, gentlemen, for here comes the speciality of the house, lamb armistan. <sighs> Spiro served the meal himself taking great care not to lose a single drop of gravy as he sliced the joint, underdone to perfection. He filled the two plates with the chunks of dripping meat. Ah, gentlemen, bon appetit. With great deliberation, I took a mouthful of the lamb armistan. It was magnificent. Good, eh? Mm. Better than you imagined? It is as impossible for the uninitiated to imagine the delights of lamb Amistan as... Uh, as for a mortal man to look into his own soul? Perhaps. Perhaps you have just had a glimpse into your own soul, eh? <laughs> yes, perhaps. And a gratifying picture it made, too. All fang and claw. Well, I must be going. But sometimes, my friend, when you have nothing better to do, sit perhaps for a little while in a dark room and think of this world and what it is and what it is going to be. And then you must turn your thoughts to the significance of the lamb in religion. It will be so interesting. And now, gentlemen, I have interrupted your meal for too long. Au revoir, gentlemen. Au revoir. Au revoir. Hmm. He's in... Interesting man, Spear, a very interesting man. You know, Harry, he, he reminds me of someone I... I just can't think who... You, you don't think I offended him in any way, do you? Offended him? No. Goodness, no. He loves that sort of talk. Lamb Amistam is a ritual with him. Get him started, and he'll just go on forever. It was a month later that it finally came to me exactly who it was that Spiro reminded me of. And when it did, I, I laughed out loud. <laughs> of course, Spiro reminded me of the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland. You remember, the cat only grinned when it saw Alice. It looked very good-natured, she thought. Still, it had very long claws and a great many teeth, so she felt that it ought to be treated with respect. <laughs> I, I mentioned this to Harry that night as we were walking along that dismal street that led to Spiro's. Uh, you may be right, but I'm not a fit judge. Anyway, it's a long time since I read Alice in Wonderland. A very long time. Help! What? Help! Look, look there. Outside Spiro's. 
Uh, Isn't that one of the waiters? Oh, yes. Looks as though he's in trouble. He's being attacked. Come on. Help! Goddamn them! Pickpocket! Push me, would you? You're looking for a goddamn fighter? Well, you, you got one, mister. Let me go! Let me go! Not yet, you lousy little creep! Well, what's going on here? Help me, sir! Yeah. This man, he, he's drunk! He tried to stab me! Oh, drunk, am I? Oh, well, we'll... we'll hey, you dirty... Hey, grab him, Harry! Quick! Look out for that knife! Let, 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 let go of him! Do you hear? Let go! Hey, what, what, what the hell's happening here? No. I'll cut your goddamn throat, mister. No, you you don't. Oh. Oh. Boy, is he, is he all right, do you think? That was some punch, Harry. Well, he, he, I think he's stunned. He banged his head as he fell. Yeah, well, in any case, it's a job for the police. No, no, sir. What? No police. Mr. Spiro does not like police. Oh, now, wait. I beg you, no police. Uh, Hi. Anyway, it's coming around. Oh, he'll be all right. But what started all this anyway? I, I, I push against him accidentally, and he accused me of robbing him. He's, he's drunk, sir. Oh, you can say that again. Well, now, you go inside and get cleaned up. We'll see to him. Thank you, sir. To you, I owe my life. If there is anything I can do to repay you. Oh, you just cut along, and if Mrs. Beard has any questions, you tell him to see me. Yes, sir. You saved my life. Thank you, sir. And with that, the waiter disappeared into the restaurant. Well, after all the excitement and kerfuffle of that incident, I must confess that I found I had quite an appetite. And as soon as we were comfortably seated in the restaurant, Harry and I debated with some trepidation as to whether or not we could expect the special lamb armistan that evening. Soon our regular waiter appeared and carefully set two tumblers on the table. We almost simultaneously inquired after the special. Uh, no, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. No special tonight. Oh, hell, just my luck. And I'll probably miss out on it next time, too. Why, Harry? You going away? Yes, damn it. I'm off to South America for a month or two in order to mount a new campaign for some very rich clients. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. When do you leave? Tonight. I managed to wangle some reservations. This was intended to be in the nature of a farewell celebration. Oh, and no <laughs> special. What a shame. <laughs> Just my luck. Uh, well, I I'm going to miss you, Harry. I have enjoyed our evenings together, and these little dinners of ours have well, they've come to mean a great deal to me. Uh, shall I serve now, sir? Uh, of course. I didn't realize you were waiting. Shortly afterwards, the waiter served us, and we turned our attention to our dinner. Harry finished his quickly and continued to bemoan his fate and to regret loudly the thought of missing Lamb Armistan during his trip. Then, just as I finished my meal, a waiter leaned over to take Harry's plate. It wasn't our usual waiter, but the man who we had rescued from the drunken sailor. I asked him how he was feeling, but to my surprise, he completely ignored me, and with the air of a man under great strain, he whispered to Harry, My life... I owe it to you. I can't repay you. Well, you have repaid me with your thanks. Please, let's hear no more about it. But I will help you, sir, even if you don't want me to. Do not go into the kitchen tonight. Huh? My life for yours, sir. Tonight or any night. Do not go into Spiro's kitchen. Why shouldn't I go into the kitchen? <laughs> don't be absurd. What's going on here? Is everything all right, gentlemen? Ah, oh, good evening, Spiro. Uh, this man is a little unnerved, I think. Ah, uh, yes. An unfortunate experience. He's saying something about my not visiting your kitchen. What's it all about? Do you know what he means? But of course. He was giving you good advice. It so happens that my too emotional chef heard some rumor that I might have a guest in the kitchen tonight. He flew into a fearful rage and even threatened to give his notice on the spot. Hmm? However, have no fear. I have succeeded in showing him what a signal honor it is to have a true connoisseur observe him at his work first hand. That is all. No, Sancho, you are at the wrong table. See that it does not happen again. The waiter slunk away without daring to raise his eyes, and Spiro drew up a chair to the table. He seated himself and drew his hand lightly over his hair. My invitation for you to visit my humble kitchen, I, I had hoped, Mr. Laffler, to be a surprise, but now the surprise is gone and all that is left is the invitation. Are you serious? 
Do you mean that at last we really are to witness the preparation of food in your kitchen tonight? Uh, no, Mr. Laffler, not both. I am faced with a dilemma of great proportions, gentlemen. You, Mr. Laffler, have been my guest for ten years, but our friend here... Oh, Mr. Spiro, I, I, I really understand perfectly. I, I mean, this invitation is solely to Harry here, and naturally my presence is embarrassing. Well, look, no, wait a minute. As it happens, I, I do have another engagement for later, and I must be on my way anyhow. So, you see, there's no dilemma at all, really. Absolutely not. That wouldn't be fair at oh, all. No. Surely, Spiro, you can make an exception on this one occasion. I'm very sorry, sir. Harry, I am not going to sit here and spoil your great adventure. Believe me. And, and then just think of that ferocious chef. <laughs> I'm sure he's just dying to get his cleaver into you. <laughs> <laughs> so humorous. So, I'll just say goodbye now and leave you to Spiro. I'm sure he'll take pains to give you a good show. Well, that's good, you, Vincent. Thanks. I hope you continue to dine here while I'm away. Oh, and have a have a good trip, Harry. Thank you. Bye now. I will expect you, Mr. Price. Au revoir. Au revoir. And so I left them to it. The smiling Spiro and Harry Laffler, about to realize his greatest ambition. On the way out, I stopped in the foyer to collect my coat, and as I was straightening my tie, I caught a glimpse in the mirror of Harry and Spiro already at the kitchen door. Spiro was holding it open invitingly wide with one hand, while the other hand rested lightly on Harry's plump, meaty shoulder, squeezing it ever so gently, almost lovingly, rather in the way a housewife squeezes a prime fat turkey before she puts it into the oven. I've never seen or heard of Harry Laffler again. Shortly afterwards, I left New York in order to do some filming in England. I've not been back since, and therefore I have never had the opportunity of dining again at Spiro's, nor of renewing my acquaintance with its mysterious owner. In the intervening years, however, my interest in food and its preparation has increased, and I... I can now create and experiment with recipes of my own. But I must confess that even in my wildest flights of culinary fancy, I, I have never yet dared to attempt lamb amistad. That was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Co-starring in The Speciality of the House was Hugh Burden with Francis de Wolfe, Vernon Joyner and William Slay. The Speciality of the House was first recounted by Stanley Ellen, dramatised by Barry Campbell and produced by John Dyers. <laughs>